Good morning, and welcome to this session entitled Healthy Societies. Uh, Sir Peter Gluckman will hold a talk in a few minutes. My name is Colly Juan Sundberg. I am the uh, initiator of Euroscience Open Forum and ran the first Euroscience Open Forum in Stockholm in 2004. My day job is as a professor at Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden. It's a pleasure for me to be the moderator of this session. Uh, Peter Gluckman is the president of the International Science Council and became so in 2021 and will be the uh, president until 2024. He is an internationally recognized biomedical scientist and currently heads COI2, which is the Center for Informed Futures at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. For about 10 years, he was the first chance, uh, chief science advisor to the prime ministers of New Zealand. And he also was the foundation chair of the International Network of Government Science Advisors, INGSA, between 2014 and 2021. Um, Peter was trained as a pediatrician and has published hundreds of papers and also popular books in different fields. A key theme has been to understand how a baby's environment between conception and birth determines its childhood developments and lifelong health and the impact this has for the individual's future. He has written and spoken extensively on topics of today, science policy, risk assessment, science diplomacy, and he has received numerous awards, amongst them one from the AAAS uh, for science diplomacy and very many other high civilian awards from both New Zealand, the US and the UK. So with that, I ask Peter to step up to the podium and deliver his talk. Thank you. Thanks very much, Carl. What I'm going to do, can we have the first slide? What I'm going to do is give you a bit of a potpourri on thinking about where does society and the people within society go over the next 20 to 30 years. There's some really hard questions we have to ask. And if you think about it, humans' desire for immortality is not new. The earliest myth, in fact, the earliest recorded epic, the epic of Gilbert Gamesh, written over 4,000 years ago, is the story of a king searching and failing to achieve immortality. And if we study right through the history of humankind, in virtu in, and in the, indeed in the early forms of pseudoscience, the search for immortality has been a driver of what much has happened. So what's happening in our search for mortality? If we just look at lifespans across the world, you can see that in about 1880, we had the same average lifespan as a Neolithic person. The average life expectancy of a Neolithic person, we think was between 33 and 35 years. But it's more than doubled, almost tripled in that time. And there's no obvious sign yet of it plateauing. And whether we look at the global south or at the global north, we see this remarkable increase in longevity. But what's actually contributed to this increase in life expectancy? What's been the relative contribution of medicine versus those of public health, education, women's empowerment in particular? And this famous graph which is well described looking at the different areas of London as described through the London underground map, shows that people living in high economic areas have quite a long uh, increased life expectancy over those living in low economic deprivation areas. And you only have to move uh, one stop on the tube across um, uh, between these two sites to see a seven year difference in life expectancy. And yet we continue with this massive increase in life expectancy to invest a lot of modern science in more weeds, ways to go. There's lots of pharmaceutical developments tackling pathways that might be involved in the aging process. We have cryonics, 
trying to freeze people to see that it can be rethawed at some time in the future. A number of biological methodologies being applied, the use of growth hormone, for example, ideas around gene editing. Of course, we've had various aspects of gene a regenerative medicine, the idea potentially of putting neurolinks into our brains to improve it, and the whole concept of transhumanism is all designed at this idea of heading towards indefinitely prolonged life. But of course, the issue that never really gets asked or doesn't get asked by those groups is the morality of it and the, how long, what is their limit to life expectancy? I think it's interesting that the science of ageing has not really shifted much in 25 years. We still think largely in terms of the wear and tear of our, on our DNA by environmental toxins. We still think largely that, that there are certain cell lines that are programmed to die after a certain period of time. And in fact, the more we look, the more we realise that the ageing clock actually starts very early in life. You only have to look at the data, which I don't have a slide of, from the Gambia of children born in the wet season versus children born in the dry season to see that there's a 15 year difference in life expectancy between those two times, which is not due to infant mortality, to recognise there's a lot we don't know about how the programming of, of, of ageing occurs. We forget, for instance, that peak bone mass, which is important for musculoskeletal ageing, occurs really around the end of the, of the third decade of life. So already from then, we're in de decline. And at the same time as all of this, healthcare is rising with no hint of plateauing in every country. You can see that we're spending you know, enormous percentages of GDP with no hint of plateauing on healthcare. And we're left with the fundamental question, is there, what is the affordable limit for a society? For whom in society and paid for whom? Or do we just keep on this execrable rise in uh, expenditure on healthcare? A discussion governments don't really want to have. And the answer will of course differ amongst individuals and stakeholders. And yet this issue of the massive increase in healthcare costs, and I'll come back to that in a moment, continues without society addressing the consensual answer needed. And in the context of all this, we have another set of issues, the demographic change. While the population is rising, fertility rates are falling, the changing nature of work, has changed this whole situation, expectation of retiring and having many years of good life after retirement is now common, whereas the, expect, the retirement ages set after the Second World War were roughly when people were into decrepitude. What are the expectations? There's tensions here, moral and ethic tensions, cost implications, that all the fundamental discussions that society doesn't actually like having. And in the middle of all this, we have a number of breakthrough technologies. And of course, you have those people that claim that those breakthrough technologies will reduce cost and improve equity access. And the more likely thing is that they'll actually drive greater inequality and greater differential uh, in terms of health care. So what are some of those technologies? They range from the gene therapies or the antibody therapies being used in cancer and the cell therapy cancers now are very expensive therapies, but for many people, very expected. They're high cost, they're narrowly targeted, and they're unlikely in the near future to come down in cost significantly. There are, there are nutritional breakthroughs, but where's the economics in nutritional breakthroughs? New vaccines are needed, the, new, the whole issues of digital medicine, what will be done, what, what use is it, what's its efficiency, its precision, its scalability, its cost, and so forth. And we have issues in drug development. Drug development is expensive and takes time. And effectively, we've seen very few, if any, new classes of fundamental drug in the last 20 years. 
And we have issues of equity, that in the current pharmaceutical model, the access to the low-income people, both in developed countries and to low- and middle-income countries, is very difficult. We have IP, World Trade Organization issues. We're putting a lot of money goes into genomics and pharmacogenomics. A lot of hype about it. But how much will this actually improve healthcare? Will the AI reduce the pressures on the healthcare workforce or will it increase and drive up costs? Certainly AI will have a major role in disease screening and diagnosis, for instance, in breast cancer and Alzheimer's screening. It, could it, have, it has a role claimed in drug discovery, but there's not real evidence that that's actually turned to fruition. Will it be used in making decisions about what care paths a patient and individual will go through? Will it therefore improve therapeutics and therapeutic choice, for instance, through robot-led cognitive behavioural therapy for mental health disorders? Will it have a potential for large impact on public health and, for instance, in disease surveillance? But the question remains, how do we balance this about the costs and the fact that in many countries of the world, we spend almost nothing on healthcare? How do we minimise the inequalities that exist between and within societies? As I've already mentioned, some drugs can be extraordinarily expensive. For instance, the, the new drugs available for cystic fibrosis can cost $300,000 a year on an ongoing basis. Where does the state's responsibility end, even in a socialised system, and who, where do we draw the line? Because the inexorable rise in healthcare costs will exhaust society eventually. There are enormous issues here of ethics, morality, fairness, and there's inevitable conflicts between those who think the effort should be in prevention versus treatment, the media hypes it up, their political considerations, and yet these are issues that need really deep thinking as the price of healthcare becomes manifestly un unaffordable. In the middle of all this, we have this very changing economic structure pattern, and we're seeing rising inequality in many countries at the present time that we see where the nadir of inequality was in the late 1980s has been replaced by, in most countries, but not all, rising inequality. And at the same time, that's looking at average inequality. When you look more within an individual country, it becomes really obvious. And so we have this problem, where do you look in the healthcare system, in this onion ring between individual and the society as a whole? And I'm gonna make a few comments on this as I move ahead. Most, if we just take this fundamental issue of individual focus versus a population focus, quite clearly the impact of increase in life expectancy has come primarily through a population focus on women's empowerment, on education, on public health, rather than on individual medical care. But in fact, if you look at the rhetoric around obesity, diabetes, heart disease, stroke, the diseases that kill 70% of the world's population. The political rhetoric is all about individual responsibility. It's my fault that I'm fat and lazy. Because it's much easier politically to focus on the individual rather than to think systemically. And I'm going to argue in the next few slides, we need to think systematically. Now, much of my work, as Carl has pointed out, has been about obesity, and I'm not going to go through it in great length. I chaired the WHO Commission on Obesity for a number of years. But I do want to say that we've got to be simple, think up here and be honest about the relative role of genes versus development versus systemic factors in the cause of non-communicable disease. I'm not going to go into any depth, but just to point out that there's an estimate if we did GWAS on every individual in the population of the world, only 11% of the variance in obesity could be explained. 
The bulk of it is developmental and systematic. And this is the famous systems map by the, by the um, UK government's foresight uh, uh, team, a brilliant bit of work to point out that in the middle of all of this is the self, but the reality is the things that drive obesity are the systems. The systems of how we live our lives, we work, the built environment, uh, the food system, the industrialization of the food supply, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and the marketing things. And I chaired, as I said, for three years, or co-chaired, the World Health Organization Commission on Ending Childhood Obesity. And not one of its 13 recommendations was about the, rec the individual. They were all about the state's responsibility to promote nutritional education, to reduce marketing of bad foods to children, promoting preconceptual care, thinking about the environment for the child in early life and so forth. The recommendations were adopted by the World Health Assembly, yet five years later, effectively not one has been incorporated into political action because they're not politically popular things to get into. We have a real challenge here of what goes on. Let me per turn to another disease, the one that worries me perhaps most of all for reasons I'll come to in a moment. Mental health disorders, including depression and anxiety, are the enormous hidden burden on every society. And you can see that they're a disease really of younger areas, at younger stages of life. In fact, I, I, I think if I was redoing this now, I would be saying that we need to pull the bump even further down uh, in, the, in, the, in the pandemic. Youth mental health, which is my particular interest, is the silent pandemic whereby up to 2019 it was estimated to expect one in seven children globally it's now thought that it's somewhere between one in four and one in five children globally. No society can operate with 20% of its young people with their subjective mental well-being compromised. It's just unacceptable. And it's moved very rapidly. This is data on the left from Denmark, uh, from the right uh, from the US. And the New Zealand data would look even worse if I showed that to show how rapidly it's changed since about 2010, 2012. Girls always show higher morbidity than boys, even though the symptomatology in boys and girls are different. And so the question we have to ask is, what has happened that suddenly, from probably relatively stable levels for a long time, rates of youth mental health have risen since about 2010, and you can uh, quite dramatically. And you can see from the Danish data, from the Danish public health surveys, that it's really a disease of young people, not a disease of old people. Some commentators make it simple. It's all about the internet. That's it. The internet came in, social media came in, and it drove us all mad. It's much too simplistic. You need to think about youth mental health as a symptom of a pathway. Our tools for developing psychological resilience, which we call executive functions, develop on a scaffolding of brain development that occurs in the first five years after conception. And if that scaffolding of, of frontothalamic pathways does not develop well in the first five years of life, you've got a brain that's less resilient to the stresses of adolescence. Now, the stresses of adolescence are different to the stresses of adolescence when I grew up. It was a different world to the one that these young people now face. And I'm going to come to that in a moment. But we've got to understand this is, again, a systems issue. It's not just what's happening to the young people now. It's what happened to them when they were younger as well. I, I like it to a building a house in an earthquake-prone zone. If you build a house with crappy foundations, a mild earthquake will cause a lot of damage. If you build a house with strong, strong foundations, 
you'll have a house that can resist stronger uh, uh, earthquakes later. So think about that. The foundations are the executive functions developed in the first five years after conception. The earthquakes is what's happening during later childhood and adolescence. So let's just look at those things, the earthquakes that are happening. And there's very many things, and my team in New Zealand works on understanding this by talking to young people as well as to their caregivers, and this is still work in progress. But some of this is pretty obvious. Rapid social change is threatening. We've changed the boundaries for various reasons under which young people live their lives and given them more overwhelming choice. Some things we can't change. Because of better nutrition, the age of puberty has fallen dramatically, and we know from robust studies, the earlier a child goes into puberty, the more likely they are to have problems of mental health during adolescence. Then, of course, there's the digital milieu, but we need to understand all the different aspects of the digital milieu. They're not the same. There's a big, there's a big and we have very little data under uh, uh, dissecting this out. Then we have issues in the broader social context of young people. Access to drugs and alcohol have changed. There have been declines in social structures for youth in many societies. The issues of peer expectations have changed. And then we have the big thing, eco-anxiety has emerged for justifiable reasons. And there's been a co-alt effect of a loss of trust in authority. And then we think about the things that happened around uh, our, the, when the foundations were being born in the first five years of life. We know that the number of children born into economic deprivation in the developed world has doubled in the last, in the last 20 years, 30 years. I'm going to show you data on parental stress, men, maternal mental health, and intergenerational issues that have compounded it. There's obvious effect changes in family structure that have occurred. And there are change milieus, in particular the use of screen time in young children that have long-term consequences, unintended long-term consequences. And we have changed parenting styles, uh, where 50 years ago, pre-adolescence was loose, post-adolescence was, adolescence was tight. Now it's the other way around where parents have very little oversight of what their adolescent is now doing. Let me just talk about screen time very much, very quickly. We have forget about the subtleties of the big shifts in our environment that have occurred with the shift in the way in which we expose people to the world. And we are learning that screen time can radically affect young children's ability to focus their attention and regulate their emotions, and I won't spend time on the rest of this slide. But this is just data from my studies in Singapore showing that the dose-dependent effect on the brain of children of less of one, two, or four hours a day of exposure to passive screen time, that is just looking at a TV screen or a, an iPad or a cell phone without parental involvement at the age of 18 months. And when we look at these children at four to five years of age, they have the brains of a child with an attention deficit disorder. Terrible changes in them. And when we look at them in other ways, their socio-emotional development, these children are not in a good shape for learning at school. They're not in a good shape to, emo to regulate their emotions. And it will compound as they reach adolescence. Similarly, when we look at them in more detail, and I won't do it now because we haven't got a lot of time, we can see when we measure their cognitive functions as they enter school, there's a one standard deviation difference, particularly exacerbated in poor homes, because it's more likely in a poor home that the child will be babysat by being put in front of a flat screen. Now, I won't have time to go into great detail, but here we have a good example of a, what might be seen as a subtle change in the environment that young people live in, which goes on to have long-term effects, which could be massive by the time they reach puberty. Here's another example. If we take a thousand randomly selected women in Singapore 
and just do a test at 28 weeks of pregnancy to see whether they've got depression and anxiety. And the block that represents subclinical, not clinical depression and anxiety, and we look at their the, the performance of these children at the age of four and a half, you can see that on every ground, these children are doing badly compared to those control. The ability to learn, uh, their cognitive and non-cognitive functions are far less. And furthermore, when we look at their MRIs, to look at their brain structures, and we look at their brain waves on the EEG, we see that simply maternal depression or maternal anxiety, maternal stress in pregnancy has long-term effects on the brain development of the child in a way which we anticipate will lead to mental health disadvantages. Long-term effects of subclinical maternal stress. And furthermore, when we do the structural functional equations to understand how economics drives this, we find the major way in which economic disadvantage in Singapore affects, mater uh, affects offspring development, it's mediated by the effect in pregnancy, not after pregnancy, of maternal stress. And I'm gonna go on to say that you can see how this compounds, compounds that children born to maternally stressed mothers themselves have inadequate executive functions development, so they're more sensitive when they in turn become mothers. And we think this is a part of this compounding issue of rising mental health concerns. So my point here is simple. Youth mental health is not just a health issue. The solution therefore does not lie in psychologists and psychiatrists, although those who are obviously exposed now are, have got illness, need assistance, but the solution lies in a wide range of domains involve, implicate as risk factors, education, social de de development, family dynamic, trusted society, and so forth. And in Singapore, where I head the Singapore Institute for Clinical Sciences as one of my other roles, the Singapore government is putting an enormous attention into this particular set of observations. And here is a point where intervention to reduce the morbidity of mental health is possible, but it requires a systems approach. Now I want to go theoretical for a moment here to another part of my life, which is spent in evolutionary medicine. And I want to point out that we are different as a species. Unlike every species, other species that modifies its environment, it modifies it to a point to maintain environmental stability. Uh, the beaver, the, the termite, the honeybee, and so forth. We continue to modify our environment, not for reasons of Darwinian fitness, but because it improves our hedonistic, our power, our, our enjoyment of life, and so forth. So we're in a continued field forward way of changing our, our environment for reasons other than maintaining our health and our fitness in Darwinian terms. And as a result of that, is it breaking, bait, biting back on us? We, one of the dangerous things I hate is the word lifestyle disease, because lifestyle disease implies it's the lifestyle I choose to have that makes me unwell. I would argue that we're dealing with a systems problem by and large, we're, we're, which, I've termed, which we term Felicia Lowe, myself, Mark Henson, Anthropocene-related disease, where what we're talking about here is diseases which fundamentally result from systems changes which have led to non-communicable diseases like obesity, to the mental health issues that matter. Now, does this terminology matter? It does for policy reasons. If I call it a lifestyle disease, or if you call it a lifestyle disease, it's on me to change my lifestyle to get better. If it's called a system disease related to our society's contributions, Anthropocene, then it's on the policy maker and the whole system to be changed to improve outcomes. Now, I'm not gonna dwell on COVID at length because I'm running out of time, but I do want to highlight this remarkable report the International Science Council produced over the last 15 years. It's on the website of the International Science Council, and it's by far the most ambitious interpretation of what's going on in COVID. It talks, 
It recognises, it talks a little bit about the virus, and talks a lot about the virus and the vaccine, and the first part of the report is dealing with global scenarios related to different levels of vaccination. But it does so in a way which says it's far more than just about the impact on the health of the individual who gets COVID. It's about the effects on mental health. It's about the effects on the health system. It's about the effects on social care, the effects on education, the effects on uh, the economy, both micro and macroeconomic effects. It's about the effects on geostrategic issues and so forth. And when one looks at the report, it also points out the pandemic will not go away, that these multidimensional effects will last for at least probably a decade, if not more. I encourage you to read the report, particularly the second part of the report, which focuses on the lessons and implications for societies. It was an extraordinary effort involving many hundred scientists, experts, policymakers around the world over 18 months, and is the single biggest exercise the International Science Council has ever taken. I'm not going to go into, you can read the slide faster than I can, but you can see that while you might argue for the success of science and vaccine development to date, the system has not actually responded particularly well. And at domestic levels, we've seen issues of the politicisation of science, the unwillingness of the policy community to think really broadly about the broader impacts, a very simplistic use of epidemiological models at time, and of course, this huge issue of the implications of disinformation. It's got huge issues in terms of how the public responded. It's become different in different countries over time for political reasons, the role of misinformation, and the fact that people have got weary of it, even though the pandemic has got a long way to play out. And I think the forecast for the next winter in the Northern Hemisphere cannot be particularly optimistic. Let's put it that way. And then you've got issues that there have always the set of moral issues were not well canvassed and discussed in societies between public health, individual rights, and you can actually see in the report highlights how politics played into play at different times. The report focuses a lot on the long-term impacts and the issues in these different dimensions and have some very precise, specific recommendations which, we have get, which certainly have been received by the World Health Organization, but need to be considered by other international bodies as well. There are structural weaknesses in the multilateral system that have clearly played a major role in this pandemic. And again, again I, and that the international health regulations are not fit for purpose, but unfortunately in this terrible geostrategic situation we're in now, unlikely to see how they can be improved rapidly. One of the biggest single issues was the failure of risk listening. If you look in those countries that had risk registers or risk assessments, it was been written for years by the expert community that there was a high risk of a viral zoonotic which would reach pandemic proportions and which would have global high risk mortality. The New Zealand Risk Register pointed out a 50% chance of a viral pandemic of this magnitude in the next five years. The UK one did the same thing. And yet, how much preparation had really been made by governments to take the risk, risk assessment seriously? And you could say the same thing about IPCC. IPCC has been effectively saying the same thing for the last four cycles, and yet the response of society and governments are relatively weak. And both these examples are, are examples of a much deeper issue. Why do policy makers downplay risk assessments? And why do publics resist harm reduction advice and risk assessments? And I think as we go through these issues, this is actually the nub of the issues we need to learn from both climate change and from the pandemic and probably from the, co the conflict in East Europe. Again, I've written extensively on this and I'm not going to spend time on it. I feel I refer you to the website www.informedfutures.org 
and you'll see these reports on the various roles of cognitive biases which lead politicians and, and uh, lay people, in fact all of us, to discount risk assessments. We have very met, met mechanisms which minimise to some ways our assessment of risk and of the ones that most be most relevant to the politician might be the one of choosing to be actively rationally ignorant. If you don't know about something, you have no responsibility to do something about it. And from 10 years in science advice, I can tell you that rational ignorance is a logical report, a response from a politician to a particularly wicked problem. And so there's some real issues in society of how we communicate risk better. The ways we do it now are clearly failing. And again, there's some obvious political issues that come into play, and I don't blame the politician. They're put in an impossible position in what they have to do. In the way governments have evolved, accountability are much more diffuse than they used to be. As I said before, ignorance is breath. But no politician will ever get credit for stopping something happening because it can't tell about it. It didn't happen. So how do we know you stopped it? And of course, there's always a trade-off between what people want now and what they really need. And these are huge issues of how we in the scientific community work with the policy community. So there's deep issues. And underneath all this, if we deal with climate change or if we deal with wearing masks or social distancing or washing our hands or getting a vaccine, we really don't know how to change behaviours well, coherently in a complex society where individual and collective behaviour needs to change without becoming autocratic. You might do it in China, you can't do it in Holland. Now I come to my last point. What are we? We're humans, but what does that mean? What really defines a human being? We're defined by being a social animal. And we've been evolved with a set of things to make us social animals. Reciprocity, altruism, trust, cooperation, language, community, collective learning, and collective knowledge. We rely on the fact that we all have bits of knowledge that we share together to make decisions. And of course, now we have libraries and data banks and God help us, Wikipedia and Google as well. And it's that which has allowed us to evolve technologies so rapidly in an accumulative way particularly once we had developed computation and, and then the internet. And so one of the issues I want to raise here as a philosophical issue is when do we stop being human? When is it that this cumulative niche modification, if you like, the progressive cultural technological evolution we underpin, when do the negative effects start to outweigh the positive effects of technology, as I've tried to allude to in different ways in our talk, the fact that there are many unintended consequences of every technology that we take. For instance, the issues of, pop of population expansion, which are driven on a lot of the climate change issue, of course came because of the public health uh, inventions of the 19th century. Oil-based technologies, people in the, who developed those technologies in the 19th century never dreamed about climate change. I would argue that digitalization is driving impacts on mental health and loss of cohesion in many ways that were never thought about by the inventors of the World Wide Web. And so when we think about the onion ring of a healthy society, I focused a lot at the beginning on the individual. I started to talk about the role of government and, and social local scale networks in creating the systems in which we lead, live but we need to also think about how we maintain a, so, a healthy society. And underneath all of that, what determines a healthy society ultimately is the concept of social cohesion. Now, I don't have a lot of time to go into social cohesion now, which is the other area I work on extensively, 
But we do know that it depends on two things. Reciprocal trust between those who are governed and are governed, and then sufficient trust and respect between different members of a society who have different, by definition, different world views and values. And of course, if you think about a large scale society, 100,000 people, 200,000 people, or whatever, there's only two ways to govern that society. One is either by autocracy, which ignores and says, no, you, you not a matter of trust, you'll do what you're told and you're not allowed to have diverse views, or you have a democracy, which respects vertical trust between those who are governed and, and those who are governed because they can be thrown out and has a mechanism for dealing with it uh, with different world views and coming to a collective decision. Both those dimensions in a democracy are grossly under threat. And I led a worldwide project led by, uh, where we look, explore with a number of experts the factors involved in affecting social cohesion. And again, I refer to the, the, the reference to read it, but you can see the large number of contextual things that interact between the internet, between social media, bet between the various changes that are going on now that are undermining social cohesion. And particularly in the democracies, we've seen a marked reduction in trust, just shown for the Netherlands and German here, from the famous Edelman Trust Barometer that shows that trust in governments is falling in most democracy. And of course, there is a huge gap, but those who, are in, who have, suffer from inequality at the bottom end of the pile have far greater gaps between those of high income and low income. So 15% less trust of population, trust governments less in if they're poor than if they're rich. And you can see that countries like the UK, European countries, that gap is even higher in the range of about 20%. This issue of trust and inequality are linked and fundamentally, our health as individuals depends on living in a, in a economic country, in a, in a more equitable country, a trusted society, a cohesive society. One last example. Democracies were built around people having different ideologies and respecting people with other ideologies and coming to a negotiated agreement on how the society would work. That's no longer the case. If you just look at the right-hand graph from America, we have seen this huge shift. So where in the past people could respect the other party, although they didn't agree with them, it's been replaced by the fact that your approach to political opposition is defined by you hate the other, the, the other lot, rather than the, the fact that you uh, disagree with your ideology. In fact, studies have shown increasingly that the ideology of, the, of let's say, the Democrats and Republicans is not particularly different. Republicans are defined by hating Democrats and vice versa. So, to finalise, how do we regulate or reverse these growing inequalities of different domains and they're not just all economic? How do we promote systems understandings in, in health? How do we balance between systems change and individual responsibility? Prevention and treatment in health are not a zero-sum game, they're different. What about the societal ethics in a complex world? What's the state of democracy that in the end has direct impact on our health, particularly our mental health? How do we resolve what's good and bad about the digital transformation, AI, metaverse, on our social being? Will we remain humans in the future in the face of that? Do we need better ways of regulating technology for the public good? And that leads to the question. The Sustainable Development Goal 3 is about health. But you look at it as extraordinarily narrow. It's not actually getting to the questions that really matter. And I think we need a real rethink. And one of the rethinks we've been doing 
is with the United Nations Development Programme, the ISC is working with the Human Development Programme to look at what human development, and here that's meaning development in the terms of how societies develop, not how individuals grow. How should that be reframed to be more holistic, to take into account that individuals live within societies in that onion ring, and that ultimately that onion ring has another layer beyond the society, and that's the environment we live in and the need for a healthy planet at all. I encourage you to read the report on the, the, the ISC uh, booklet on the website on conversations on rethinking human development. It raises some vi very deep issues. So with that, I will thank you. It's been a potpourri, but you can start to see the issues which I think are not being grappled with by governments. When you think about healthcare, it's always about Oh, we need more hospitals for total hips or whatever. There are some really deep issues here that the scientific community, from the medical to the social to the ethical, needs to start thinking about. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Peter, for a full plate. I don't think we can solve everything in this session, but I look forward to questions from the audience. There's a Slido type of interactive element you can find on the web. So please post your questions. Since this is an open forum, I expect you to come up with questions. So we have one from Tobias Hoffman. Related to opportunities, risks of new genetic techniques. Maybe you can put that up. Um, can you comment on the risk that different regions of the world take different stances on what is ethical and what is not, for example, in gene editing? Well, I think it's one of a many technologies where having a fractured multilateral system is a real problem. We actually do need to regulate and, or to have adaptive regulation on a lot of technologies that are more global. And so if you think about the new genetic techniques, you've got somatic gene editing, which has already been used in gene therapy for a number of diseases. But of course, the whole issue is around germline uh, gene editing, which has an enormous number of ethical issues. And the problem is there are very few technologies that can be ever absolutely regulated. This one is one of those. And we've seen one claim case already very controversial case of germline gene editing in, in China, as you remember. It's no different to any other technology. There are technologies that if they get regulated differently in different parts of the world, ultimately there are conflicts and spillover effects. So if I just take the use of genetic modification or gene editing in food, there are very different responses in Europe, North America, Australia, China, uh, Canada, and so forth. In the end, that has to harmonize. But in doing so, if the harmonization doesn't take into account a far better quality of conversation, it actually gets more fractionated. Obviously, there are genetic techniques, particularly somatic gene transfer, somatic gene editing, which can do so much for a range of diseases if we can understand how to use them properly. Cost is a huge issue. Probably be something that has always got an inequality of access to it, or at least as far as we know, for a long time. And the benefit of doing that, to, benefit, to, to help individuals who are at risk, and of course, if I had cystic fibrosis, I would like to have my lungs repaired through, through gene therapy if I could. But who's the cost to? And that is the issue that really arises around so much of this. The cost on the state will have, always have, must have a boundary. Now in the 1980s and 90s, there was lots of discussions. And I remember the Netherlands was right at the front of it, thinking about how do you have a conversation with society around the barrier limits on health care that the state will provide. It's a hard conversation. Funnily enough, the only place it's ever been resolved is in countries that don't have universal health care, where in fact it's up to you to choose what you can afford to pay through health insurance. 
because that actually defines the limits of your health care. Now, I'm not advocating for that at all, don't get me wrong, but I think that we do continue to have this hard conversation as the, right, the rates of health care are continue to rise, as that early slide showed, inexorably and, and on and on and on, and, and we, the scientists, find more and more ways for more and more technology and more and more expectation of it being available. We run out of money at some point. And so the, there is need for conversations, which governments hate. Governments hate conversations that involve values and involve really complicated trade-offs. They're impossible for governments to really conduct they always descend into a partisan, shallow debate. And somehow, the broader scientific community has to take the lead on some of these discussions with the public in co-design. I'm very hopeful that some of the new experiments in democracy, representative citizens' juries, participatory democratic techniques, may be a way to take some of this discussion away from partisan politics and to a way that we can have a discussion on the consensus, whatever it should be, because there are different... The other thing is, you say words like new genetic techniques. Well, that covers a lot of things. And I think there we got into the GM debate badly in Europe because we had sweeping rules as we did in New Zealand. Rather than actually being very clear there were certain outcomes we didn't want, there were other outcomes we might want. And so we, be, we get ourselves into, legislation is the birth, worst way for dealing with rapidly emerging uh, 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 technologies, but we don't have an adaptive precautionary regulatory approach to compensate and get away from the so let me intervene there a bit. So, so you're saying that the conversation is essential, of course, with stakeholders, broadly speaking, not only scientists, but definitely not partisan politics. But we need to involve, I presume, then the public, yep. patient organizations, citizens at large. And uh, do you see any country doing this to some degree so that the push on politicians to understand these things deeper and take more, let's say, um, fundamental decisions, does it happen in anywhere? Not really in healthcare. I think the issue of patient advocate groups get involved and they have a particular view. There are some experiments being done in New Zealand now talking to young people, not necessarily young people with, with mental health problems, but young people about the system in which they live and what needs to change. Perhaps the most interesting example about which I know least is Iceland. Iceland is a really interesting experiment, although its ability to extrapolate to other countries is perhaps limited by the nature of the, and size of the Icelandic population. But if you go back to 2000, the rates of alcohol and drug abuse in young people in, in Iceland was extraordinary. Very, very high. Something like, and I don't have the data in front of me, so don't hold me to it, about 35% of 15 to 16 year olds reported being drunk to the point of incapacitation in the last, last month, last 30 days. That was the metric. It's now down to about 5%. What's happened that they could take alcohol use and drug abuse went with it down that rapidly? They talked to the kids. Kids said they were bored. They didn't have things as in social mechanisms for which would give them safe risk-taking behaviour. And we can talk at length about what the risk lays safely. But the things that could be done by co-design. We with have more people. questions. That we yeah, I've stopped. So Iceland is one case, but I would say that across the board, alcohol and uh, drug abuse has gone down among young people for all kinds of reasons. Maybe a good side effects of the social media slash being gaming on on the web, who knows? We have other oh. questions here. Um, one is, how can we get the message across to policymakers? You can choose question here. You mentioned echo anxiety. Can you elaborate on, okay, could we keep on questions, please? So we haven't chosen yet. Uh, so the echo anxiety question, polarization, but literacy as well on health issues. 
and then how come some holistic approach in healthcare, Ayurveda, Chinese medicine, etc. Um, I don't see the question. Or not always being taken seriously, etc. So, which question would you like to address? Oh, I'm not sure, but I'll well, have I'll a crack at Jan Marco to start with. Uh, seeing he's in the audience wearing a bright green suit again, I suspect. Um, we, we, we've seen a lot more polarising during the pandemic. We saw it also before. So it was happening before. The pandemic's just exacerbated things that were happening. I think for the last decade, we've seen social media and the whole phenomenon of identity fusion, whereby when you align with a group, you become more loyal and, and you drive your emotions to be more ideologically in the group than before. It's a bit like a person who undergoes a religious conversion and becomes more religious than the people that he joins the group of. So that's been going on for a long time. We also know that conspiracy theories, disinformation, are greater, are better received by people who are less trust, who have less trust in government and in elites. And there's an overlap between lock, less of, loss of trust in governments, loss of trust in academics, loss of trust in scientists, although governments have always fall out the worst, but we're all part of an elite that loses trust. What I think we've learnt is that the communication in dealing with this relies not on experts, it relies on the community itself getting involved. For instance, I was working with some young Maori, which is the indigenous people in New Zealand who were being bombarded with disinformation about the vaccine. Well, that, it wasn't me who was going to change their minds about that. It was the TikTok entertainer or the, uh, the people that they respected as authority figures who needed to be involved. Now, we could spend two hours on dealing with disinformation and I'm not an expert on it. But yes, there was increased literacy, but was it complete literacy? What people were hearing was the modelers say this or the modelers say that, flattening the curve, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It did not be a complete understanding of all the implications of all of this. And we didn't do a very good job of explaining why it was good science that we moved from not recommending mask use to moving to mask use. And that we, because we were not very good and, and we need to get better, science lives with uncertainty. Science is an evolving topic. Uncertainty is about what we live with. Funny enough, my experience with politicians is they, they understand uncertainty too. My understanding of people, the more I talk to them is, we should be, when you admit to the uncertainties, they trust you more. And I think the dogmatism that some of the epidemiologists and others showed actually undermined trust. I think if we'd been more honest about the assumptions that were being made, the modeling, the, the, the um, uncertainties in the models. May I ask you, because you mentioned that TikTok influencers, for example, could play a role. And we, we did a study in Sierra Leone where we used a WhatsApp intervention, randomized control trial, to address a certain misinformation, misconception in Sierra Leone concerning certain infectious diseases. And interestingly, we used a local well-known uh, musical group as a part of these WhatsApp messages. And it was clear that this type of intervention with a more, say, acknowledgement of the uncertainties, but still the evidence is such and such, had a great influence on people. So I think we needed to research on what works to, let's say, convey scientific messages as well, and not only provide facts, but study methods to get to understanding and insight. I, I think that's right at the heart of the issue, that we may not be the best interlocutors no, but like on, on some of these issues to the target audiences. No, no, but the, but the musical group of Sierra Leone or the TikTok people might be if we study what mechanisms exactly, are. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. And it's another question here difference. that we could have lined up before we have 30 seconds left and a soundbite response. So could we see more questions if there are any? I think these were the questions we had. So um, are you altering here? Okay, how would you rate ethics amongst doctors? Why are one quarter working cosmetic 
area of vanity health. I don't know what that number comes from. Um, and then ventilators. What's your opinion? Okay, this is a tricky question. Oh, Aidan Aiden what? Gilligan, my friend, you love oh, asking. Aiden. He, he, he's, he's inevitably going to ask me this. That's got too many questions in one. <laughs> ethics amongst doctors. Well, doctors are human beings, and I think they are more trained in ethics than most, but there will always be some. Humans respond to incentives. And if, you know, one of the problems in general practice at the moment in many countries is it's failing because they, they earn less. And therefore, you, you know, if you want more psychiatrists, pay them more. But at the moment we value, we value certain forms of medical intervention much higher than others. So why does the surgeon get paid, earn five times as much as the physician? I mean, this is the reality of incentives in play. Why does a soccer player get played more than a rugby player when we both know that rugby is a far better game than, uh, <laughs> than, than soccer? And who won, by the way? Ireland? Oh, oh dear. Um, this is a national tragedy for me. Uh, what was the score? 32-22. Oh, Tight okay. game. Okay. So why is the anger about having ventilators before COVID? Look, I think that's precisely the point I was trying to make. We have an unequal world. The multilateral system failed in multiple ways in COVID. It's failed in multiple ways in healthcare. I mean, the, you know, I don't want to get into issues of corruption and other issues, but COVAX was not successful. The WHO took a time, I think the WHO's more recent performance was much better than it was in the early years, in the early days of the pandemic. I think we've got to be very careful how we talk about it because there was geostrategic players involved and WHO is an underfunded organisation which is dependent on disproportionate funding from a few sources. So the issues go well beyond science advice uh, in itself. It's power games and we power have, structures we a, outside. We have, a, we have a broken multilateral system. Mm -hmm. My argument would be to track two organisations like ISC, the, the, the multilateral NGOs, are going to have to play a far greater role over the next decade as we enter a second Cold War where the multilateral system is, the formal multilateral system is clearly not able. I mean, we talked about it yesterday the, the, uh, at a COVID session the ISC ran. We, here we are, the greatest existential threat since the Second World War for most people, COVID. No meeting of the Security Council, no meeting of the General Assembly specifically dedicated to it. Leave it only to the Ministers of Health when in fact it's manifestly obvious that the issues go into trade, they go into geostrategic, they go into mental health, they go into education, they go into economics, etc., etc., etc. The multilateral system did not respond appropriately and is not designed appropriately to deal with the global existential crisis. One of, I, one of the questions I often 30 ask... 30 seconds. One of the questions I often ask in my science diplomacy lessons, when I lecture on the science diplomacy is, how would the world make a decision, if it had to, to employ geoengineering? Think about it. We have no mechanism mm -hmm. that we could actually apply either to stop one country in deploying it or to agree globally that we should employ it. Deep issues that we need to address. Let's move forward. Thank you so much, Peter Gluckman, and everybody attending here in the room, as well as online.